is starting. Here we go. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the first Levitim On Air Not. Today, Vishnu Ratish is going to be talking to us about photography, and it's a primer which covers history of photography. So, hi, Vishnu, take it away. Uh, thanks, Avi. Uh, so uh, today, uh, like Avi said, today we are looking at uh, photography, and what I'm going to cover is uh, some basics, uh, some terminologies that uh, that are used in photography, uh, especially the uh, the DSLR world, and uh, and some tips and tricks on general uh, techniques of taking a photograph, and how to make a photograph look uh, decent. So, uh, diving in, uh, first we cover some basics. Uh, what is a DSLR and what happens inside a camera? So, uh, what is DSLR? DSLR stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex. Uh, to understand why it is called that, uh, we have to take a look inside the camera itself. So, uh, below uh, on the screen, you can see a cross-section view of a camera. So on the left side, uh, there is the lens, and then at the right side, there is the body of the camera. So basically, uh, photography, the word means uh, to uh, draw light. The term itself, if you split it and go to the bare, bare meaning of the word itself, means uh, to draw light. So a camera is basically an equipment to do that. So uh, from the left side, if you see, that's where the light enters. And on the right side, where you see the sensor is where the light falls. So within a DSLR, to make this happen, uh, there are other things that you need to take a picture. When you need to take a picture, you need to uh, do a little more. So first thing is, as a, uh, as a photographer, that is a person who's taking a picture, you need to see uh, what you of what are you going to take a picture of. So, uh, say example, uh, we look at a scenery and we want to capture that. So we aim the camera towards that uh, subject and uh, we click the picture. So what happens exactly is the light that is out there in the scenery travels through the lens right on to the sensor. But before that. Uh, as a photographer, I want to make sure uh, what I am going to capture is up to satisfaction, or what I want, what I am seeing is what really is really the picture that I want. So to do this, uh, inside the camera, there is a mirror. The mirror basically uh, reflects what the lens sees uh, onto a pentaprism that is on the top, and that pentaprism mechanism reflects the image back on through to the viewfinder. So this is where the photographer is essentially looking through. So what he sees is the uh, real uh, world you know, image that is out there. Because since there is multiple reflections involved, what he sees is really what is out there. And also, uh, since the mirror is placed uh, in the uh, the way the mirror is placed uh, basically reflects uh, the exact image onto the eyepiece, which would essentially be falling onto the sensor. So it's exactly what you see is what you get. And uh, this is different from a different uh, from a normal point and shoot photograph, uh, point and shoot camera, wherein essentially the viewfinder would directly look through from above the lens and uh, uh, and the photographer would see what is uh, what is uh, in front of the viewfinder rather than what is in front of the sensor. So this makes this particular mechanism a, a precision instrument uh, in the sense it's exactly what you see. So uh, uh, so when we take a picture, what essentially happens is light travels through the lens, hits the mirror, and we see through the viewfinder. Once we are satisfied with what we see through the viewfinder, we click a shutter release button. There, if you look carefully, there is a, before the sensor, just before the sensor, there is a shutter, and this shutter opens and closes uh, as soon as we hit the uh, shutter release button. Uh, that is the exact uh, moment at which uh, the 
light falls on the sensor and that information is captured. And later on, it's digitally set over. So we get literally the picture. So this is exactly what happens inside the SLA. Now, uh, next we take a look at some terminologies uh, based on uh, what we saw uh, in the previous slide. Uh, that is, uh, first terminology or basically a setting that we need to know about is the shutter speed. So when we look at the DSLR, we see the shutter and the shutter speed is the length of time uh, or the duration for which the light is allowed to fall on the sensor. So what this means is uh, how long uh, does the shutter remain open? So it, it's measured in time, so it's one thousand of a second, it could be one twenty-fifth of a second, uh, one second, two second, or even you know, infinite, uh, depending on the type of photograph or the light we're trying to capture. So uh, inside the camera, the mechanism is basically what you're seeing is the mirror. It opens and the shutter opens. And the black part you see for a short duration is the time when the light hits the sensor. That is the sensor. Uh, are you guys able to see the animation? Yeah. Uh, looks good. All right. So what does this shutter speed uh, let us do in terms of a photograph? So let's take a picture of a waterfall. And uh, roughly, this is what uh, happens when we, as humans, look at it. Uh, this is a freeze frame of that. So it looks clumpy, and there are a lot of bubbles at the bottom. And the overall picture of the waterfall itself is rough and unpleasant to look at. Uh, uh, so what we can do in such situations is uh, we can uh, you know, reduce the shutter speed. That means keep the shutter open for a little more than what we have clicked this picture with. This picture was taken at 115th of a second. Uh, so if you take the same picture with two seconds, uh, you get a smooth and silky uh, finish for the waterfall. And uh, at the bottom also, uh, uh, it's very uh, pleasant to look at. Uh, so what has happened here is the shutter has remained open for two seconds. And uh, the light, or basically the water flowing, the light from that has redrawn itself over and over, creating this you know, surreal, smooth, silky picture. So this is what the shutter speed setting of a DSLR lets it do. The next one, uh, we look at aperture. So aperture is a hole within a lens. So like we saw in the uh, initial diagram, uh, the lens is the uh, part of the camera through which light enters. So aperture basically controls the uh, amount of light uh, that enters the camera. So to, mm, to put it into some context, when we see the James Bond ads, you see uh, James Bond in the center and there's a circle drawn around it. So that particular circle is the aperture. And what we see around it are the blades or the diaphragm that uh, controls the uh, size of the circle. So the size of the circle determines how much light enters the uh, camera. So, uh, so basically, the, the, the diaphragm, as we see in these various uh, pictures here, uh, for different diaphragm settings, uh, the circle it generates or circle it draws with the help of the blades uh, is, you know, it, uh, is either wide open or it's really narrow. So a perfect uh, 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 a size of the circle determines the, how much exact amount of light we need in a particular situation. Uh, also, the uh, uh, the number that is denoted below that's basically uh, called as the f-stop number uh, in uh, in the f-stop number terminologies uh, terms. If you look at the widest open is the smallest number, it's two point eight, and the smallest aperture is a bigger number that is uh, 20p. So at 2.8, essentially your lens is wide open and it's taking in as much as light as possible. And uh, at 22, uh, there's very minimum light coming in. So essentially, if we generally think of when would we use uh, these two or anything in between is depending on how much light is there in the environment or, uh, where, or the place where you're trying to take a picture. Say if you're at a, 
uh, you know, a candle light dinner. Sorry. A hey, quick question. So, what does the number uh, mean? Is it like a ratio of some sort? Yeah, it is a mathematical ratio, uh, uh, which basically uh, 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 it's basically the uh, uh, it's a formula which uh, gives out the exact number or the uh, size for a particular. Uh, uh, particular lens. So if you look at the uh, a number which is uh, really small, that means for uh, uh, I can give you the, uh, I, I'll, I'll explain to you uh, this uh, with the next slide uh, with a picture so you understand a bit more. But uh, generally what this, yes, what this means is uh, at, uh, if, you, uh, if you want to relate it, it's basically the depth of field. So if you go in uh, and look at the next picture, that is uh, uh, here you see Wally with, a, with a, another toy behind. So the first picture is at 2.8. That means the uh, lens was wide open. But the depth of uh, field in focus or the uh, area in focus in terms of depth in, an, in a plane where you're taking a picture is very shallow. So you could only see uh, Wally clearly, but the rest is blurred out. But whereas uh, if you keep a, a higher f stop number, you will be able to see much more in that field in depth. So, so if you uh, at two dot eight, you'll only be able to see uh, just very shallow. So uh, a little bit, uh, say the width of the toy or the depth of the toy. Uh, the, uh, that is Wally, and not anything behind it or anything before it. Uh, a little more uh, better example would be uh, if you look at this cherry. Uh, so at 2.8, uh, you can see the cherry which is in front. At 8.0, to the similar setting. Uh, same, I mean, while creating a picture, if we keep the same lighting environment, uh, get the second cherry and the ones behind also a little more in focus. And if you keep it at really high number, that is 32, you get almost everything. If you look at the way the cherries are arranged, it's in depth of the field. Got it. So essentially, the new uh, Android camera, when it does let you do the lens blur, is essentially adjusting the depth of. Field. Uh, so what uh, in uh, in Android uh, basically what is happening uh, with the new update that you're talking about? It's more of a uh, more of a a, a, a post processing trick rather than the same what you're seeing here. It uh, it it uses a shallow depth of field and captures uh, the image at different angles and overlays them. And when you say I want something in focus, so it basically moves the focus with the depth of field. So uh, to clearly make you understand, uh, there's another picture. You see this? Uh, so in this, if you look at it, the last uh, section of the image. So this is basically a pond which has some leaves on it. And at the end of it, there's a show. So you can see the whole, uh, almost all of it in focus, right? But uh, in a very shallow depth of field, that is uh, 2.8, you could only see a cross section of it, right? So in Android, what happens is it takes the smallest one and pretty much takes pictures of everything. Got it? And then when we say we want something else in focus, it pretty much brings that section in focus. Vishnu, effectively, in the, I mean, basically, uh, of course, without sort of a lens and an aperture, uh, you can't uh, adjust the depth of field. So that's why in the Android cam you can't. So it's it's basically set to something like the like uh, 2.8, right? So it's, it's yeah. set to like a shallow depth of field. And then what you're saying, it does is it takes uh, it takes the photos at different focus points. Because if you uh, if you know if you notice, it asks you to tell the camera. Oh, got it. I haven't tried that feature, but it sounded. Yeah, like are, are we might uh, concur with that, right? Got it. But from what you're explaining, that's sort of what I pictured. That it sort of takes like from the top to the bottom and sort of slices in terms of uh, focus right. in depth so of field, and then it makes it together this. Yeah, so, fo so here, an another point is uh, focus is something 
uh, which uh, you know it not necessarily what is in the center. Uh, so you can focus any part of this, but the point being the depth of field will be only this much. That is this short area. So I could focus my camera to the shore, which means only the shoreline will be in focus. The rest of it will be out of focus. Right. At two dollar. Right. Got it. So it's not necessarily. I mean, it's not the center as much as whatever. Yes. Is the point. So okay. correct. So Found that the depth of field is impacted by the. Yes. Aperture setting, right? Correct. That, 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 that's exactly. Right. So focus is a function of the lens, well, uh, and the aperture is also a function of the lens. But a focus uh, basically is the uh, so if you look at three D, right, and uh, uh, focus is in the uh, in the x y plane, and the depth of field is in the z. You get that. So focus will be on the x y. That's the two D plane, right? So which area, which point uh, you want uh, to be in focus? But the depth of field is like how deep inside the image, right? So if you're sitting on a table, you have the edge of the table which is close to you, and then the farther edge and everything in between. So between that range, how much do you want in focus? So, so another picture here. This one, this one basically shows uh, exactly that. So here I have a set of uh, wine bottles, and uh, it's laid out on a table. That table also has other stuff. That is, in front of the wine bottles, you see uh, a, a stack of cards, right, uh, or basically some pamphlets. And behind uh, there is a screen uh, which has some other image. So, what what I've done here is I've taken I've focused my lens to this subject. This is basically the line of bottles, okay. And I've kept a very shallow depth of field. That means pretty much the width of how much the bottle is that is in focus, and everything else is blurred. So if you look at the pamphlet, which is at the end, the you know, the near end of the table, and everything behind the table is pretty much out of focus. You guys follow that? Yep, Vishnu. I, I think that and this is an awesome photograph as well. Looks really cool. Thanks. Nice composition. Yeah. Uh, you took this photo. You took all these photos? Uh, not all. This one I did. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, this is a really, really yeah. amazing composition with the big. Sort of poster behind the pamphlets in front, but just out of focus enough. Looks really beautiful. Yeah, and yeah, uh, being very quiet. So yeah, there's a quick formula for the focal the f number. Basically, it's n is equal to f by d, where f is the focal length and d is the diameter of the uh, uh, aperture. Yeah. Oh, aperture. Okay. Hey, sorry, could you repeat the window? Yeah, it's basically m is equal to f by d. So uh, f is the focal length, and d is the diameter of the aperture. Okay. So that kind of gives you the f-stop number if it's f uh, two uh, two point eight or f one point four. Hey, thanks, Manu, for the formula. Yeah, but. Uh, uh, generally, as a uh, as a rule, right, uh, the uh, the depth of field uh, basically works with the number, uh, like we said. So, uh, especially in zoom lenses where you have a uh, changing focal length, this means different. That is what uh, when was getting, right? You know? Yeah, that's what I was uh, getting. To. Yeah. All right. Uh, so moving on, uh, another uh, feature of the camera, uh, basically it's of the sensor part of the camera, is the ISO. This is basically the uh, uh, sensitivity number for the sensor. So uh, this is uh, reminiscent from the time when people used to use film cameras. So film, the photographic film material used to be uh, of different uh, chemical compositions, which made it, you know, uh, uh, 
the the sensitivity towards light uh, for that particular film uh, are different. So, for example, the material of film that you would use to click a, a, a landscape out in the sun would be different from uh, the material that you would like to take a picture indoors or uh, like a fast action shot. So. Uh, the numbers, the ISO obviously stands for International Standards Organization, and the number was basically awarded to each uh, different chemical composition of the film. So that is carried forward in the digital era, and uh, nowadays uh, uh, the the ISO numbers. Uh, so the ISO numbers that are available now are were theoretically pretty much impossible with the uh, uh, with the, the physical uh, film elements at the, at that time. Uh, nowadays, though, uh, the best of the cameras uh, do have really high ISO numbers. The higher the ISO number, the more sensitive of surface is towards light. So that's demonstrated here with a series of pictures uh, at ISO 100, a particular you know, uh, glass of wine looks in a way. And at ISO 320, ISO 800, and uh, ISO 1250, 2000, and 6400. So essentially, the environment's light was kept same, but uh, the sensitivity of the sensor was changed over each of these shots. So as you, as you can see, uh, around uh, around 800, or, uh, the exposure was perfect. But as the uh, as the sensitivity the sensitivity was increased, uh, it, the image got blown up. And the same thing happened when the sensitivity was low; it uh, it kind of you know, darkened the whole image because the sensor wasn't sensitive enough to capture enough light. But the problem with ISO is uh, the amount of noise and green that you know, seeps through when the, sen the sensor is really sensitive, that is 6400. The best of the digital cameras nowadays do handle this very well, even at this number, but uh, they're really, really expensive. And, uh, and for photographers, for amateur photographers like us, it's basically uh, uh, important for us to keep it within a a good range, anything between uh, in a really bright sunny day, 100 to 200 is enough. But if you're inside the room itself, uh, try to keep it within 100 to 1600, uh, you'll get good shots, acceptable shots. Uh, on a DSLR, on a point and shoot, 1600 still looks good. Yeah, so it, it clearly, yeah, definitely. So it, it clearly uh, uh, depends on the sensor size and the the quality of the sensor and how well it you know reacts to it, how much light is available, and it varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. Yeah, but in some sense, you know, it's almost like the you know arguably the ISO factor was is uh, earlier it was it was what was on the film, right? So right. now it's much more uh, simulated, right? So it's yeah. you know it's it's almost like. Uh, uh, I, I guess uh, you know you can sort of get a relatively similar effect. I mean, high noise and grain with uh, shutter speed adjustment, except mm -hmm. that uh, especially for high sensitivity applications, you probably will, uh, you know, you probably have shutter speeds that are so slow that you need a tripod or there may be right. other things that might fade out the picture. Absolutely, yeah. But, but it's almost like now it feels like it's. It isn't as much of a factor it is as it used to be. I remember when we used to take with uh, uh, with uh, actual films because there you can't you can't control the noise and grain or you know. Anyways, the ISO is never dynamic, right? It's just a fixed ISO on the film. So, right. This uh, uh, that said, uh, higher ISO numbers actually work sometimes magic with black and white photographs. So if you're clicking a picture which is black and white, and you happen to have a really high ISO number, the greens add. Uh, a lot of uh, meaning to the picture. Nice, interesting. Yeah. And and you're saying only film or even in sort of the digital? In DSLR as well. Actually, I mean, Raj, I found that you know shooting at night shots using um, ISO sometimes even digital is fairly useful because you don't have. It's very rare that you'll have the ability to use a. Um, in a fast shutter speed, you'll have to end up using a really low shutter speed with a low ISO. So you end up with really bad photographs. Like really right, 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 right. No, 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 I'm just saying conceptually it was sort of more, I, I mean, you can almost call it something else now, right? Like Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually the, on a point and shoot, it's now the EV plus minus rating. It's not yeah. ISO. 
you put it up plus one plus two plus three just amps up the sensitivity of the sensor. Yeah, so interestingly, the sensitivity was to do with sort of the, like Vishnu was saying, the chemical composition right. of the film itself. And I'm just saying, I'm just saying they've kind of maintained the same terminology, but yeah. it's, it's completely different now. It's all sort of done digitally or whatever. It's it's no more that. I mean, the grains and all are probably because of how. Yeah, are. even now, though, uh, the the quality of the sensor, like I mentioned, the manufacturers, mm -hmm. right? It, it it kind of de de uh, defines the far end. So oh. the higher the ISO number, right? If it's not a good digit pro a good processor, it it may not give you good results. Yeah. The most expensive ones. I like think the, on DSLR uh, these days, the ISO actually measures the sensitivity, uh, the, uh, the sensitivity of the image sensor. So what happens is uh, if you push down the uh, uh, sensitive uh, the image uh, sensitivity of the sensor, you don't get all those white flags, which are those. Uh, if you take dark, uh, night shots, mm -hmm. you get all those white dots in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens is those white dots are kind of um, due to uh, issues in the, um, the sensor. camera sensor. So what happens if you boost down the uh, sensitivity, you don't get all these white flags versus when you boost up the sensitivity, your sensor is more prone to giving up all these white dots in the photos. Exactly. Yeah. So the next slide that I was going to do was exactly demonstrating that. So uh, what, like Vinu said, uh, at, this is a single uh, shot with ISO 100 and the other one is at ISO 1600. Seemingly they look similar, but uh, it can, as we have learned so far, with ISO 100, uh, we wouldn't need a, uh, I mean, we could do with a really fast uh, shutter speed with ISO 1600, uh, uh, the other way around. So, uh, but the problem comes when we try to crop a picture or try to zoom in to see how clear it is. So the same image, if I zoom in towards the you know tip of that ball firing that's at the center, you can see uh, the amount of white dots. This is what you were talking about, then, right? So this is really high in the ISO 1600. Hmm. It's sort of interesting how like a very very uh, uh, I mean maybe I'm over remarking, but very very sort of a chemical nature has actually translated so similarly into sort of a very digital... It's basically the physical nature of light. Only. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking of, because, you know, ISOs used to be only on the film, right? So I'm always... Right. Okay. Not on the, it wasn't the camera setting, right? It was always... No, it was basically if you were... Uh, if you had a 200 uh, ISO film, and that's yeah. what generally was sold everywhere. So you would... Uh, right. Stick yeah. with for the next 24 or 30 shots with that. Okay. I just <laughs> and rest that. all have to, uh, you have to do with shutter speed or add a flash or do something to get yeah. the picture. <laughs> Actually, there that's is right. one. Yeah, I haven't one. used the DSLR, but I've used an SLR a lot. So that's nice, right. So that's. Yeah. Raj, there is one difference between the ISO and the chemical and the, and the digital. So the digital is essentially giving you higher noise on the higher ISO, so basically higher sensitivity. So it's like it's an electrical boost of signal and noise, both go up. Uh, in the chemical ones, you'd find that the grain size is also larger. Right. So, uh, so that would be one difference between the ISO on the chemical and on the electrical. Where okay. here, the grain size doesn't change, but the noise level goes up. There's the discoloration goes up, chromatic aberration and all of that. Right. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. I mean, it it seems like the graininess that used to be there is kind of manifesting in sort of a, more of a haziness and. and uh, yeah. Right. So now, uh, after all this, uh, taking a picture, basically uh, on your DSLR or a camera which has uh, settings, uh, it uh, manual settings, uh, it comes down to three uh, three settings uh, and a combination of those three settings, that is aperture, shutter speed and ISO. So uh, it's the same subject with the same environment. Uh, it's basically the combinations changing and you can see the desired picture, whichever you like. So that's the, the control that you have with that such an instrument. Okay, so this is basically, uh, this was uh, the basics of uh, our DSLR or any camera with manual setting, or what you could do with it, or what it means. So moving on, uh, some simple tips and tricks of uh, uh, taking a picture. Uh, this is a, uh, it's a widely open topic and uh, no uh, <laughs> hard and fast positions on how we can take a picture, but there are certain guidelines that everybody 
know, suggests that you follow and results uh, more often than not are good for those. So let's take a look at those. So first we look at some composition techniques. So first one is framing. So in this, uh, basically we use the elements of the picture itself to you know, frame the main subject. So in the first picture, a doorway was used to uh, frame a door and the rest of the scene. In the next picture, you can see a lady standing with uh, a natural frame of a window. And the below picture, uh, even though this was uh, not planned or something, obviously you cannot uh, wait for a bird to fly that way. But just because uh, the picture was taken and we could see the aesthetic value of the bird being within the art and not overlap. So this is some techniques that we, uh, this is one technique which kind of uh, makes a picture stand out. The next one is uh, the most famous and uh, common rule, I would say. It basically involves breaking an image down into thirds. It's called the rule of thirds, wherein an entire picture or a frame you can divide into grids. There is nine grids, and uh, uh, each column being a one. So one plus one plus one equals your frame. The point of this such a grid being uh, our eyes are naturally drawn towards the intersection point of these uh, lines as we see. So it's marked in red. And if we you know, uh, position our subject within uh, one of these areas, or one or two or more, uh, it gives balance to the image, as well as you know, uh, the, uh, it's very, the image seems pleasant. So, uh, and uh, one example of this is uh, there's a rock in the middle of the desert. Uh, we move the rock slightly towards the left, and uh, uh, that uh, kind of fits in the rule of thirds if you see the intersection point. Overall, if you look at the picture, this picture on the right is a little more balanced, per se, in terms of the elements of the picture. So uh, the, the, the rule of thirds, uh, the idea uh, being uh, more towards you know, some symmetry or uh, the, uh, the position of the elements. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, this same idea could be applied to many things like presentations and websites as well. Then you, know, you use or take photographs which obey the rules. Uh, so they blend in with the whole presentation that you're trying to do or the website that you're trying to design. Scale, crop, or position the photograph to make them obey. So you may have an image, but if you are able to scale it or crop it in such a way which kind of obeys the rule of thirds, it sometimes uh, you know, gives you good result. Then uh, when you're making a presentation, especially if uh, you're combining image with text, uh, that also if you put in this uh, grid format where at the intersection of lines you place an image or uh, text uh, along the grid lines, it gives uh, a good feeling. And the image, overall composition of the image is balanced. So some more examples here. But uh, like you said, it's, uh, it's a rule, but this is more of a guideline. So if you take a picture in this, in this example, uh, the first picture, the subject is in the middle, whereas the next picture, it's on the left. But if you look at the final image, both are okay and okay. That's because of the wing getting at the uh, edge of the uh, frame, but uh, it's not necessarily that always it is true. So it's more of a guideline than a view. But it's a good practice before we take a picture the next time. It's like uh, where my main subject in a picture is going to be, and uh, which particular square or rectangle that I'm that I'm going to place it. In. That is the center of the subject. If it matches any of these uh, intersecting grid lines, that would be ideal. Another composition rule is leading lines. So this is again using the elements within a picture where. Uh, they draw attention to the subjects. For example, in the first one, there is this uh, pond, which is a long uh, rectangle. But the edge of the pond is used to draw attention to the kid and the rest of the elements in the picture. The 
center one again, there's a trail of water left behind by the boat. Assuming maybe that's where the eye is taking the picture from, but it leads way to the mountains. So it again all like eyes naturally follow the lines and it gives the picture a good thing. Same thing with the road. So this is a picture that I clicked and kind of uh, at the time I didn't know, but uh, <laughs> when I learned a little more, figured out the, the lines in the middle kind of leads towards the palace in the middle. Nice. The uh, another composition technique is angles. So you uh, uh, angles is something uh, that there's no rules to it. That, uh, the weirder the better because the amount of pictures that we are seeing these days are the more different the picture looks it sometimes more like it's because it's a visual uh, you know it appeals to our visual senses that it's something which looks out of pattern that also works so this one uh, on the left is the bridge in Mumbai uh, it's taken from the under the bridge itself so it gives a different feel the next two are basically playing with the elements of the picture, trying to you know, create some angle which kind of you know, speaks. So it can be a fun element in the picture. Then another composition technique is texture and patterns. Where, uh, you know, our eyes and brains, well, we all know, are tuned for pattern recognition. It's been as part of evolution itself. So our eyes and brains are tuned for that. So anything that is in symmetry, our brain automatically thinks it's, it's you know, familiar territory or it's something is in good arrangement. And there's almost zero resistance to acceptance. Everything in, it's lying around in a particular straight line of the ribs, which is symmetric in nature, our brain just accepts it. So uh, the example for this is like tables in, in a coffee shop or a restaurant which were arranged and the photographer has clipped the picture. The overall symmetry is balanced, so that's one pattern. The textures, uh, the elements of the uh, pictures, if you can create natural textures, like uh, sand mixed with gravy, water, or, or drops of water flowing, something like that. So different patterns and textures is another way of composing a picture. Nice. Did you take this one, Isha? Yeah, this one and this one. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, the next uh, next technique uh, basically is lighting. Obviously, taking pictures is all about light. So, where the light is coming from on the subject. So, this particular one, uh, the light is coming from in front of the subject. This is assuming you from a flash, uh, but it illuminates the subject well. Uh, at the same time, at the background is blurred out. Uh, uh, there are other ways in which uh, light can be uh, used. That is, uh, 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 from the background, uh, this creates a silhouette effect. So these two I clicked. Uh, so this is uh, the, the light is coming from the window into the house, and on the other one, it's an outside, but the sun acts as the light source and which is behind the subject that I'm right. So it creates a natural silhouette effect. And same thing uh, but from the sides. So if you think pictures, uh, rather than if the light is coming from the front, wow. if it's from an angle, uh -huh. from, a, <laughs> from an angle, uh, it creates dramatic effect. Uh, I could have used flash, but that would have illuminated everything. But this light is from on the left, picture on the left, light is coming from the right side from a lamp and it illuminates the face from the right side. And same thing, it's in a balcony where my mom is actually facing inwards but light is falling from the left side so it creates some drama. Is the same reason the picture on one side, the, the uh, like the picture of Mira was a little sort of softer if you yeah. will, why the other one felt sharper. Is it Post-processing? Yeah, that was post-processing. The softer one was post-processing. Yeah. Oh. Because uh, that one, uh, the setting, uh, I changed the setting of the camera. The light was a bit more harsh. 
So that everything was almost dark and it didn't go well with the overall color of the picture. So it demanded for a little soft softness. Also, uh, yeah, that's pretty much uh, what I had to cover in terms of techniques uh, and things to keep in mind uh, when you're taking a picture. Another thing that I wanted to uh, show you guys is this this particular picture. If you notice, uh, the, there are small reflections from the background, which kind of draws this small circular thing, right? You see this? Right. This is a blur. This, this is called a bokeh. And this is a function of your aperture. So, uh, so if you look at the, the aperture, right? So the shape matches that of the aperture. So the more expensive or the better your lens is, the more number of blades are used. And the number of blades determine the, you know, the circular shape of the aperture that, you get, yeah, that gets created. Lesser blades means uh, it will be like a hexagon or a, you know, a septagon or something like that, which will have like edges. So obviously, everyone knows the circle is made of infinite number of lines. What uh, an aperture does is it uses the same principle, but it uses blades to do the same thing. So when the blades uh, kind of come close together, uh, the circle becomes more and more perfect because the edges are kind of getting more, right? So you get more edges, so the circle gets better. So, so if, you're, if you're taking a photo which is wide open or halfway through, you'll see sharp edges in your bokeh. But if you have a lens which has a lot of blades, uh, like seven, eight, or nine, your bokeh would look really beautiful or circular. Like you see here. Mm. Vishnu, this bokeh should not happen if you have like a smaller, uh, I mean, if you have a larger aperture though, right? Because your depth of field would kind of make those... Uh, yeah, behind yeah more, more things will be in focus, so that will become more clear. So this will go. So it's only when the larger or smaller apertures... The yeah, smaller aperture number. Basically your lens is wide open. Yeah, sorry, I mean in the in the smaller aperture size or the larger setting where yeah. uh, the depth of field is small and then, uh, oh sorry. No, it's the other way around. So okay. if the number is, uh, if the lens is wide open, your depth of field is wide open. Got it, got it. Got and it. if the yeah. lens is closed, the depth of field is wide open. Okay, I, I see now, I see now, okay. Got it, got it, got it. So in the larger aperture, anyways, that up, this thing itself is much smoother as well. So right. Mm. Nice. Yeah, I can. Uh, we uh, we try on different lenses right? and we take the same picture with the similar setting uh, at the same focal length and everything, but different lenses. Mm. You will be able to make out the difference. Yeah, there will be different cookies uh, that. Yeah. Some general tips and tricks. This is available everywhere on the net, and but these are some which I felt uh, I should write down or mention these. So uh, first is keep still for a few seconds when you press the shutter release. So this is before and after both, because especially in mobile cams <laughs> when you have a lot of apps running, sometimes the click is a tad late. <laughs> so. But it, it does give you an instant preview so you know what's happening. So it's not big of a deal, but holding your breath maybe for that one second would give you a little more sharp. Mm -hmm. uh, then avoid flashes unless you know what you're doing. Uh, because uh, flash creates a really harsh light. And unless you're in full control of that light, uh, it may ruin your picture completely. So unless uh, it's a really dark, environment that there's no other way, no other light source in your camera is unable to capture anything. You really have to use a flash and you have to use. But otherwise try as much not to and try to take around with the settings which are manual settings and see if you can get a picture. It's worth it rather than just you know whitewashing a picture with a flash. And then when you're picking group pictures uh, two, three, maybe three or four is a must because uh, you would not notice the small you know, somebody's eyes three fourths closed and <laughs> almost all those things. It may appear okay when you're looking at a small preview, but when you look it up or you're trying to print it, it looks really bad. So click as much as you can. 
but nowadays we are not limited to the size and the number of uh, frames you could click with an older camera so take as much as well and then uh, edit your pictures a bit before you publish them uh, this is uh, nothing bad or wrong with your camera or yourself uh, it's just how things are uh, light is really uh, fast and it's awesome but uh, we can only do so much to get in control even the best of the cameras can capture light only in a particular way so in going back to the days of old film photography there was post processing involved the thing that uh, the part where you give the photos to be washed or getting the prints out that's basically post processing and the guy who did it would generally uh, you know have a bit of control over the cameras that he has and the pictures that we take when they come out from the negative there would be slight variations and unless I mean, we are doing that bit, that much bit to put it out there. I mean, change the brightness a little bit or adjust the contrast slightly. It would give a lot of depth to your picture and need to look at it. Then back up your backups. <laughs> I've lost many, many, many pictures, <laughs> so that's one thing. And then uh, print some pictures and print them big, and it feels really good. I did that sometime when I went to Mumbai, and some of them are hanging at my home. It it just feels great. Really. Pictures are big. Rather than you know, see in a small, so do this. That's what I want to share. That's it. Is there a site that you use for your backups? Uh, site. Uh, I do. Like I said, uh, uh, physical backups. Many of them. And uh, right now, my pictures are uploaded on Picasa as well as Google Plus. So if you don't want to share them publicly, you can also use uh, Dropbox. So I usually back it up on Dropbox plus Google Photos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So back of backups. Yeah. <laughs> back of backups, exactly. How much more you can keep it. Yeah. <laughs> it just goes off. <laughs> I have lost some really good shots. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is an amazing intro show. Really inspired yeah. to go out and <laughs> Pick up a DSLR now and start to play it out. <laughs> also, <Awesome>. why not? <laughs> yeah, there there are many many other topics that you could cover, but I think I just yeah, jot down really the main ones. Sure, it will be part of a series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can do lenses maybe next time. Is there yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, I think great start. I think this is really nice. Do you guys, what do you guys think, Raj, at the Avenue? Yeah, it was a great presentation. Very nice. Nice, nice topic, nicely done. Yeah, really nice. Yes. Learned something new as well. Yeah. Yeah, very good uh, start for this issue. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Cool. Thanks so much, Vishnu. All right, guys. I'll drop off. Just got another, you know, got the other marketing call in this event. So. All right. So, okay. Cool. Cool. All right. Bye. Catch you guys. Catch you guys in a bit. Then. All right. Yeah. All right. Yes. Bye. Bye.